Uh, hi everybody, my name is Jack. Um, I work at the Web3 Foundation. Um, I'm really excited to be here, so thanks all for coming. Um, it can be, as it is a cozy, cozy atmosphere in here, please feel free to throw your hand in the air if you have any questions. Happy to like stop and answer anything or go back to something that is, is interesting to you. Um, so I'm going to be giving an introduction to Polkadot um, generally, and, um, but briefly I'll, I'll talk about where I work. Um, so I work at Web3 Foundation. We're focused on um, uh, building a decentralized web where users are in control over their own identity, data, and money online. So kind of taking their digital sovereignty and making it theirs online. Um, and to do that, right, to have like a user up at the top, there's a number of things underneath, like the plumbing, underneath the, the kind of the browser or application that needs to be built. Um, so there's APIs, there's programming languages, there's second layer protocols, first layer protocols, which are kind of like um, um, Polkadot, obviously, um, Ethereum, but then also messaging and, and some other stuff. So there's a lot that needs to be built. Uh, so we at the Web3 Foundation are focused on um, facilitating, being an advocate for it, funding the development of these different protocols. And Polkadot's our, our primary project right now. And we think it's really important um, to move from what is Polkadot down here um, up the stack to, to get to a point where there can be mainstream decentralized applications, right? We're doing this because we want users using this stuff. Um, and, and, and to do that, we have to get over a number of different um, kind of infrastructure level stuff. Um, and Polkadot kind of does some of that. So what is Polkadot? Um, Polkadot is an open platform uh, for flexible and autonomous economies acting within Polkadot's security umbrella. Um, so basically Polkadot is about facilitating um, many different um, markets, systems, blockchains um, to kind of focus on their one application um, and, and not have to worry about the plumbing of like um, um, networking and consensus and having a group of validators and um, building a, a robust ecosystem of miners, things like that. It just hopefully allows um, developers to focus on the stuff that they want to focus on um, and do so in a way where the whole system is kind of uniform, moving in lockstep, um, but also highly upgradable um, from the kind of the core of the system that I'll get into um, to the different component parts that are kind of sovereign and made up of individual application developers serving real users. Um, so first I want to get into a little bit of values. So like, what's the intent behind Polkadot? Outside of like the technology and the architecture, which I'll get into in the second half of the talk, um, why, are, why are we doing this, right? Outside of, we, yeah, we want people to have control over their own identity, data, and money. What specifically about Polkadot um, helps us get to that vision? Um, so um, one, of the, one of the things I mentioned is, right, it's for autonomous economies or uh, autonomous software acting within the security framework that's global, right? So Bitcoin's so exciting because there's this, all the security, there's $100 billion of uh, like a bounty on this, on this kind of uh, distributed ledger that um, has, ha is secured. Um, um, and um, Polkadot hopefully will provide uh, that much security, but w the component parts can kind of take advantage of it while serving real users. Um, so it's, it's really about empowering developers, lowering the barrier to entry for users um, so that they, you know, they have very little software they have to download, applications they have to download, tokens they have to buy to actually use these applications, right? Um, and then de developers are kind of empowered to have really custom um, um, applications um, and that um, Joe will get into about Substrate, all the different ways you can kind of make your application or blockchain specific to your users, and uh, as well as dealing with the problems of scalability, security, governance, developability, all of those things. Um, so one kind of go-to metaphor would be like, um, yeah, please. Yeah, so like a metaphor would be um, the United States. So the United States has a security umbrella at a federalist level. It's a federated kind of system. Um, but the individual states within it have their own kind of individual economies where they, ha where they give up some um, uh, uh, kind of the, the monopolization of violence to like the, the federal level. Um, and they can focus on kind of serving the people in their state for whatever they want to specialize in doing. Um, and they have a lot of governance like decisions they can make while still acting within the security umbrella. Um, so you could think of the different applications as kind of semi um, 
autonomous um, um, communities or markets that, um, that kind of give their security up to this larger framework um, that is Polkadot. So that's kind of like, it's like a feder federal system in that way. Um, and it's also about, um, Polkadot's inherently upgradable. So it has governance built in, um, right? We stand for um, kind of this radical approach to technology development. Um, we're against not doing something, right? We're, we're about, Polkadot's about risk taking, Polkadot's about upgrading, um, Polkadot's about um, um, not only de adopting new software, which is really exciting as it comes out, um, but it's also about um, interacting with other protocols, right? Like a lot of us, I, I personally got into this, one of the reasons I've got into the crypto is because kind of this idea of autonomous software is really exciting. Um, something that's out of control of over any centralized entity. Um, and um, uh, Polkadot does that kind of at the core layer, but also for all of these individual economies that you know, parachain developers or individual, individual developers can build. Um, so um, diving a little bit more, uh, a little bit deeper into that, um, um, Polka, uh, Polkadot's component systems are, are empowered to do as, as they want. They can have their own governance, they can have their own token, so, uh, they can even have their own consensus in some cases, um, um, and um, uh, it's kind of up to them to opt in the system, opt out of the system, right? They have complete control, um, which is really exciting. Um, and uh, they can do so in a private way as well, which is useful for enterprises and stuff like that, where they want to have some data over here and not give it to the, give it to the rest of the public blockchain. Um, another important thing is there's no platform lock-in. So uh, what I mean by that is, um, um, uh, so there is a, a, a token with, with Polkadot. There's this, this, this dot token, um, and it's a proof of stake system. And um, so, uh, a speaker tonight will get into the, a little bit more into NPOS, the proof of stake system. But um, um, so, but we don't want dot tokens to be a barrier to entry for people using applications, right? If your if your parachain has one transaction per second or a million transactions per second, you shouldn't have to pay more dot tokens. To use the platform, right? There's, we don't, we don't, we, there's no notion of gas in Polkadot. Um, there's no, there's no uh, requirement for your application users to have the application token and and the Polkadot token, right? Uh, it's not really designed to 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 to, to do that. Um, so a little bit into the features, um, and then I'm going to dive into the, the architecture. So. Um, so, so taking a step back, um, Gavin Wood, co-founder of Ethereum, first CTO. Um, um, uh, the, over there, kind of designed. You can just exit. It's fine. It, th there'll be enough. Okay. Um, designed the EVM um, and um, kind of realized the inherent scalability issues. Right? You hear about scalability is a really big problem in blockchains and in um, decentralized systems. Um, and um, you know, each node has to compute all the, all of, and store all the state, and so it's really like um, hard to hard to scale that out. Um, uh, Polkadot, as well as kind of Ethereum 2.0, takes this view of sharding, where like each node has a little bit of information about the whole state. Um, so it's like a way to a database architecture way to, to kind of scale the system. Um, Polkadot's similar to that, um, but you can think of the um, the shards, if you will, as individual blockchains. So in like tech speak, this is called the heterogeneous system, uh, meaning each individual blockchain has its own state um, transition function and its own uh, its own business logic. Um, and um, so you could have like, you know, somewhat like an Ethereum virtual machine parachain um, that hangs off of Polkadot um, and then duplicate that like 80 times because there's 80 parachains for one, one, um, one relay chain. So that's like 80 times the throughput. But you can actually do it so one, instead of just 80 like EVMs, you have one for privacy, one for, um, yeah, smart contracts, one for, um, like really fast payments, and one for like an oracles, and one for a stable coin, right? You can kind of make application specific use cases. Um, so the byproduct of this approach to scalability through parallelization is interoperability, which is really exciting, and what kind of people associate with Polkadot when they think about, okay, Polkadot allows blockchains to communicate with each other. Like it's kind of a naive way to describe Polkadot, um, but it's, it's helpful, uh, right? And, and, and that's actually a byproduct of the main um, design feature, which is this approach to scalability. Um, and when I talk about interoperability, I'm not just talking about token transfers. I'm talking about um, any type of arbitrary data 
Um, so Polkadot's super agnostic, super general. It makes no assumptions about the data packets sent between systems and economies on Polkadot. Um, that's kind of the standards and the primit token st primitives, like the ERC-20 or whatever you want to um, would call it in the Polkadot ecosystem, are up to users to create. Um, so parachains can design in ad hoc ways um, the APIs used to communicate with it. It can blacklist other parachains or whitelist other parachains and have special language for communicating amongst specific parachains. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this whole system, um, while each component part can kind of upgrade itself, change itself, uh, attach, detach from Polkadot, um, they all share state meaning they all kind of report back to this main relay chain that stores the state for all of the economies, all of the applications in Polkadot. So this is really exciting because like, one of the reasons DeFi has worked so well in Ethereum is each smart contract on Ethereum, whether it's MakerDAO or Uni uh, MakerDAO, um, it's a stable coin, or Uniswap, like decentralized exchange, they can trust the security guarantees of the other smart contracts, right? Because they're all plugged into Ethereum. Um, with Polkadot, it's similar, but for blockchains. So blockchains can trust each other. So there's this fundamental problem with blockchain interoperability. People are building bridge solutions or peg zones. Um, but if one chain has $3 million of security and one has $10 million of security, it's like where, like, there, there's a fundamental bottleneck of, of how much in the bridge authority you can um, um, trust that the other chain won't be reverted later on. So you make a transaction with one chain, it's later reverted, and you never know about it because these interactions are asynchronous, so you don't actually get um, receipts back every time they do something on their own. Um, and they, so they share a pool of validators, um, which is kind of a novel, a novel thing, and what makes Polkadot somewhat unique is this notion of shared security. Um, so the architecture. So I'm going to show you a picture of what like a fully loaded pair, uh, uh, relay chain is. So, and then walk you through the steps that compose this. So in, 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 in the middle is, is a relay chain, and then each of these are parachains, um, and there's like 80 on there. So you can imagine little logos here, one for like um, Edger, which is a smart contracts platform, or like Ethereum, because this one's a bridge, um, or like Zcash, or like um, a Chainlink parachain, or a Xerox parachain, or an Aragon parachain. Um, um, and those are the component parts, and I'll get into each one of those real quick. So firstly, starting with a relay chain, this is kind of the major, the most economically important thing, right? Because as I mentioned earlier, this stores the state for all the other parachains on it um, uh, in a way that's, that's, that's scalable and um, um, really, you know, it sounds easy, but the, the research is still ongoing. It's really difficult to actually do that. Um, so the relay chain's um, main role is providing security for all the parachains and passing messages between them. So it facilitates that interoperability component. And on the relay chain, the actors on the relay chain are validators. So these are full nodes, staked full nodes on the, on the relay chain. Um, and they kind of take messages from parachains, um, add them to the relay chain, and grow the relay chain, um, and then make sure the other parachain gets any message um, that would be sent to it. Um, and they can also be fishermen, which means they're also kind of monitoring all the other actors and all the other validators um, in the network to make the sure they can, yeah. So that, and yep. So we used to kind of describe fishermen as its own component role, but um, it's not probably there's not going to be just people who are just fishermen. Mm -hmm. We can we, we expect them to be either validators on the relay chain, or um, uh, collators, which sit on the parachain. So on the parachain, you can think of like parachain valid. So who's bundling the transactions on? The parachains. If the validators are doing it at the relay chain level, who's doing it at the parachain level? Um, we call those collators. Uh, but so the parachains are kind of the, the autonomous economies I was talking about earlier. Um, these are the application-specific blockchains. These are the uh, a smart contract platform or um, kind of a zk snarks like um, privacy um, blockchain or something like that. But on those sit these collators, which are also staked full nodes, but a little bit less economically important. So while the validators on the relay chain will probably have to stake around like 5,000 dots or so in the, uh, when we launch and, and kind of slowly reduce that amount to where there's a lot more validators because that's kind of the main scalability thing. More validators, more parachains you can have, et cetera. Um, but collators aren't as economically important. So they kind of give suggestions to the relay chain. They say, hey, we think this, this state transition function happened on the relay chain. Here's you know, our, best, our best block. Um, and the validators on the relay chain say, okay, thank you. They take the header, 
um, which is a lightweight kind of um, less less kind of data, and add it to the relay chain. Um, and they can also be fish run. So this is kind of what one parachain attached to the relay chain would look like. You have the collators that kind of collate or bundle transactions on the parachain. They pass proofs to validators who sit on the relay chain. And the validators on the relay chain take that. And they don't actually have to know that everything happened here was, was faithfully executed. It's up to the parachain to decide how to bundle blocks, how you present the blocks, all of that is kind of up to the parachain. But the validators um, have something that says oh, that they can run the, the block through to know whether or not it was uh, like put together in a valid way. And they add it to the relay chain. Um, and then you can also do not only kind of native parachains that point their consensus or their security to Polkadot, um, but you can do ones that have their own validator pool. You still, you, know, you still have the fundamental thing of this is a bridge, and they have two blockchains with two different economic um, guarantees and uh, security guarantees around um, how, like how much, how, essentially how much money they're worth. Um, uh, so so the, it's a little bit higher latency. Like Something like Ethereum and Bitcoin are, are, don't ever finalize, so you kind of have to wait, just like if you deposit to exchange, how you have to wait for like however many blocks on Bitcoin to like get your stuff. It would be the same with a bridge, because um, there, there's no finality on those chains. But um, you, can still, you can still interoperate with Bitcoin and others. So that's what it would look like. Um, yeah. Exciting. Could you point again on this here? Could you point again at the, at the components and, and so the, what they are? So this is the relay chain. Right. And in them are parachains. Um, these are validators that sit between the, pa um, the parachain and the relay chain. Sorry, this is the parachain. Uh, validators sit between them and take blocks from the parachain, add it to this relay chain. Um, and collators sit out here and bundle transactions from re like real users. Um, so Polkadot, as you can see, is pretty like a pretty developer-facing platform. It's not like we expect it to be used by like you know the guy walking down the street. We want we want the users out to be out here, um, and kind of the the applications to be in here at the parachain level. It's just um, artistic. <laughs> well, it would, it would be the interchain communication. Yeah. With, uh, how one parachain communicates with another parachain through the relay chain. Oh, I think it symbolizes that. Yeah, I think, yeah. That's, that's right, Emil. The message passing. So these, these the, the relay chain is the like glue this? that ties everything together. Yeah. Uh, so this one is like a... a, a, a yeah, exactly. This is a para relay chain. So this is kind of... We're going to launch Polkadot with, say, five parachains at launch, um, if we get everything in order. Um, it'll scale to about 80 parachains. But eventually, a relay chain runs out of slots. So then you can kind of do this thing where you kind of have this recursive thing going on, where there's a relay chain of a relay chain. So like, sure, this relay chain has 80 parachains, but one of those parachains happens to be a relay chain that also supports 80. So you have this hierarchical structure where messages can bubble up and down kind of a tree um, that kind of looks like that. Um, so you kind of have a para relay chain here, and you can kind of do like an Ethereum 2.0 implementation and like a bunch of other para relay chains. Like, so that's, that's something that we're going to do um, um, after we deliver the first implementation of Polkadot later this year, um, is something we're going to begin work, uh, working more on um, to get to this point where there's you know, a, a, high, a much higher degree of scalability than even Polkadot v1, which is you know, Quantum Leap Forward provides. Um, so you have, you know, the logos here helps you kind of visualize what, so Polkadot's not just a proof of stake blockchain launching and it's like, hey, validate transactions, right? It's like, it's supposed to, it's supposed to be a whole, a whole network that's launching that provides some infrastructure. So Polkadot's like, Polkadot, I like to describe it as infrastructure for infrastructure. Um, so kind of these first order things, again, may not be totally user facing things. It's not like a, it doesn't have to be like a, it could be like a Facebook chain, but it's, it's usually going to be stuff that's like, you know, a bridge to Ethereum or like another smart contracts native platform or, you know, lightning fast payments or privacy or things like that. Um, so where are we now? Um, we just launched POC4, uh, which basically means uh, we'll get into NPOS later tonight, uh, nominated proof of stake. Um, but it's essentially a way to, to ensure a high, a high number of validators, high security, um, and not too much centralization on like one validator like you see in some like delegated proof of stake systems. Um, so that's running. There's a bunch of nodes like um, you know, uh, you'll hear from Pokescan later tonight. They have, they're, they're current with the latest testnet. 
Um, yeah, so Gavin's doing this, Gavin Wood's doing this pretty similar to how they first coded up Ethereum. I think there's nine proof of concepts. Um, this one, there'll be around seven or whatever. Um, but yeah, there's governance, so we're doing on-chain governance um, upgrades in the wild. So whenever I say Polkadot's inherently upgradable, I, I mean that it's like people are submitting proposals like we would at our government legislature, but they're code. Um, and they're, they're automatically enforced whenever they pass. Um, so that's, that's already implemented. Um, and now we're kind of working on the last things, which are interchain message passing. So that's kind of the holy grail of interoperability. Um, we have that working on, on some closed test nets now, and we'll be implementing it soon on the main test net. Um, and then Cumulus, which is essentially this mini project within Parity that makes it really easy for substrate-based change, which you hear from Joe, to become parachains with a little bit less coding and stuff because you have to set up a call later node. Um, so yeah, and then it's just like we're, we're already starting audits. We just posted our um, like uh, audit RFP, so um, we're kind of almost developer ready, kind of uh, uh, feature complete, um, and we're just kind of rolling through audits until the fall and winter. Um, we're hopefully we'll launch by the end of the year. Um, last thing is a plug for Web3 Summit. Did anyone here go to Web3 Summit last year? Nice. Okay, so w maybe some new, new faces this year. So Web3 Summit is a gathering we have uh, annually in Berlin. We had the last one, uh, the first one last year, um, August 19th. Um, so it's really a good way to get an intro to like the Web3 ecosystem. So not only is uh, the founder of Polkadot going to be represented with Gavin Wood, um, but like, you know, the Ethereum community will be there. The founders of like, you know, Filecoin were there last year and Tezos and Definity and some of these other kind of third generation blockchains and stuff uh, kind of all come together with this idea of, you know, collaborating, you know, not doing redundant work. Polkadot and Substrate are all about not doing redundant work. Um, so kind of providing a platform for the community to come together and, and work together. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, here are some links. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs>